Part three. What happens as Latinos? What happens as Latinos overtake African Americans as the largest minority? We're in a situation that reminds me of this remarkable poem by Paul Salan that Cornell uses at the front of his book. Let me recite it for you as I enter into this three, third part of my talk. Paul Salan says, speak, but keep yes and no unsplit, and give your say this meaning. Give it the shade. Give it the shade. What I'm asking from my African-American brothers and sisters is give me some shades. Give me some shades on this black-white discourse. Give me some shades on this re reaction to what's going to happen as Latinos overtake African-Americans as the largest minority. Together, can we lead a coalition for democratic reform? Can we take the new demography and turn it into a new democracy when the brown hyphen comes across the color line? Can we develop wider conceptions of US history? Right now, I'm so impressed by how much the Civil War, the Civil War as a defining moment, while it pushes aside these other dates of 1848 and 1898, what happens when these other wars become a basis for this critical reflection? You should not underestimate what I'm calling the Brown Millennium. My teacher, Charles Long, also Cornell's teacher, was recently at Princeton, and he gave a lecture there on the Pope in Cuba and why the Pope went to Cuba. And he had this to say. He said, well, he said, the reason the Pope went to Cuba is because there's a well-known secret in the papacy that the future of the church is not in the Northern Hemisphere. It's not in Europe or U.S. anymore. If the church is going to continue into the next millennium and the one after that, it's going to be with the people in Latin America, in Africa, in India. He says, you could almost say that in so many words, the papacy has written you off up here in North America. He says, the meaning of the Pope in Cuba has to do with the fact that the Christian tradition, if it's ever really going to continue, has got to be with the people who have been suffering all this time. What hopes do we bring to this dialogue for renewal between Latins and black people? Certainly one of the things that we can bring into this is new, renewed discourse about what race is, what race has meant to us, who we are racially. And certainly our contribution to this discourse can be at the level of language. You know, one of the great myths that we have to deal with in Latin America is that Latin America, especially Mexico, is somehow a combination of Indians and Europeans. It's one of our great color lines, but it's left out all of this African contribution. We know the slave trade came through there. We know that over 60% of African Americans in the Americas today speak Spanish and Portuguese. So we have to do some criticism of our own color line in this way. There's been a long and complex history of race and mixtures. Um, and there's been also some remarkable types of criticisms of racism uh, in the Latin American situation. Could I have the slide, please? I'm thinking about people like Carlos Alonso in his remarkable work on the discourse of the Cuban anti-slavery movement. And Lorna Williams' The Representation of Slavery in the Cuban Fiction. This is a, a slide I have for you. I wanted to show you this slide. Uh, it's cut off uh, the title of the slide. It's down here. Uh, it's called El Legado de África en México, Africa's Legacy in Mexico. It's part of a Smithsonian traveling exhibit. And the title of this picture is Tres Hermanas, Three Sisters. These are three sisters from Guerrero, Mexico. And I just want to leave it up there for a while. Certainly one of the contributions we can make is in the different combinations of racial mixtures that we have experienced. But the second one I want to mention before I end has to do with the notion of language and Spanish. You know, recently I read this uh, article by one of your colleagues up here, Anthony Appiah, on a multicultural misunderstanding, marvelous article, but some things in it bothered me. You know, he sort of seemed to enjoy saying that, uh, you know, 50% of Latinos don't speak Spanish. Well, 50% of us do. <laughs> and what you have to understand about the borderlands is that Spanish is being replenished all the time. 
More African Americans, as I said, speak Spanish and Portuguese in the Americas. Spanish has been spoken longer in the Americas than English. What you have to understand, Professor Appiah, is that Spanish is a language of the Americas. It's not some foreign language that's going to go away. It's not going to go the way of Italian and Polish and these other languages. It's going to be part of the 21st century and the Brown Millennium. But it's not going to be a part of it without terrible crisis. We know that in Miami, 75% of the people speak languages other than English at home. 60% of the people are not fluent in English. And in New York City, 4%, 40, 40, 4 out of 10 speak other languages at home. In the black and brown confrontation in Palo Alto between blacks and Latinos on bilingual education, a black parent said, hey man, if you want to learn English, I mean, if you want to learn Spanish, go back to Mexico. Would we, would we be doing the same thing if we said, you want to do Kwanzaa, go back to Africa? Both of these positions are unacceptable. It's very important to get a sense of how, how powerful Spanish is, but not only Spanish, as Juan Flores, in his article on broken English memories, points out, it's not just a matter of Spanish, because we know our Spanish uh, is mixed up. It's a Spanglish, and Puerto Ricans speak this remarkably complex and rich and very fast Spanish. <laughs> huh? Huh? As one Flores points out in Broken English Memories, the mixture of Spanish and English is not an absence of one language or the other, but it's a site of new meanings and relations. These breaks in the languages where English breaks Spanish and Spanish breaks English, this is an, a space where we can do some new creativity together, where languages and racial identities bifurcate, recombine, and are mixed code memories this is not some sort of thing to be see as polluted or something to be avoided. I like very much, in fact, what Doris Summer says about the future of languages. She says, quote, this is certainly not an argument for a Tower of Babel that will quake and crumble with the frustrations of incomprehension. Instead, I want to defend code switching. And then this great line, as one of democracy's most effective speech acts, along with translation, and speaking English through heavy accents. Because, and this is what we need to remember, they all slow down communication. We've got to slow down communication and labor through the difficulties of understanding and reaching agreement. Now, let me also say, as I close, that for those of us who speak Spanish or speak Spanglish, uh, we, we do this not only with affection and communication, but sometimes there's a sense of humor in it. And we like the humor of our language. In this remarkable book called Spilling the Beans, Spilling the Beans, you got it? By Jose Antonio Burciaga, he says this about the way Mexicans speak Spanish and the kind of situations you can be on in the border. He says, sometimes these bilingual cognates that we use can be bloopers. He says, Vincent Price has been known in the Chicano community as beans and rice. Somewhere in the Southwest, there was a teacher who thought his Chicano kids were calling him Cool Arrow. When in fact, when in fact, they were calling him Culero, which is an insult. One morning, our friend Muggins called and my mother answered. Trying to be courteous, he asked my mother in Spanish how she was born instead of how she was awakened. Buenos dias, senora. Como nació? instead of como amaneció. Jokes abound about Latinos who come to this country and read English signs in Spanish. Back when Cokes were a dime, a Mexicano put a 10 cent coin in the machine but did not receive a bottle of Coke. He waited, hit it, and nothing. Finally, he just read above the coin slot where it said dime, or in Spanish, dime, <laughs> which translates to tell me. So he bent over to the slot and whispered, Dame una Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs>